and welcome to Filibustering History, a podcast series where we discuss what historians do with their lives. I'm Rob Denning, lead faculty for the history program at Southern New Hampshire University's College of Online and Continuing Education. Now, every year, September 17th is Constitution Day in the United States, where Americans celebrate the document that is at the center of their national government. This year, on that day, Patrick Calloway, a doctoral candidate in history at the University of Maine and an instructor at SNHU, gave a presentation on the origins and provisions of the Constitution. A recording of that presentation is up on our podcast feed now. And here, uh, James Fennessy, the Associate Dean of Faculty for SNU, and I are talking to Patrick about his background, his research interests, which includes constitutional issues and early American economics, and a bit about his life in grad school. You can think of this as the -the behind-the-scenes DVD extras of the Constitution Day presentation. I think the business folks would even call this synergy. Or maybe they weren't. I don't really know what that word means. But whatever it is, here we are. The recording is a bit rough at the beginning, but it gets clearer as the conversation goes on. I promise. What is your name and what do you do? Hi, my name is Patrick Calloway. I'm a PhD candidate in history at the University of Maine. Uh, I occasionally teach here as well as a teaching assistant. I also teach online at Southern New Hampshire. I also work in information technology on the UMaine campus. Uh, when I'm not busy doing all that, I'm trying to finish up my dissertation. That is quite a, quite a pile of tasks in front of you. So what is your uh, academic and professional background? I have a BA in Bachelor's of Arts in Social Science and a BS in Secondary Education, University of Montana Western, a Master's in History from Montana State University, and my PhD will uh, be from the University of Maine. Uh, outside of academia, I've also worked as a Historic Preservation Officer in Virginia City, Montana, environmental education, and a high school teacher along the way. Actually, could you explain a little bit about that role? We've in- interviewed some executive directors of historical societies and other people associated with historical societies, but I'd love to hear what that role entails. Uh, What that is, is a government position. So I was an employee of the city of Virginia City. And Virginia City is a historical district, as it was one of the original gold strikes back in 1863 and the first settlements of Montana. So what the Historic Preservation Officer did was that it would work with the certified local government, which was the Virginia City, and be a liaison between them and the Historic Preservation Office at the state level primarily focused on trying to preserve the historical buildings and historical character of that district. I had it pretty easy in terms of Virginia City is a relatively small town and most of our economy was based on tourism, who would come to an actual authentic type of Western town, as we still have the old boardwalks, the old jail, all those older buildings that you would associate with an authentic town as opposed to some of the more touristy, you know, put together in the 1960s types of places in other venues. So that was my job was to help run things like permits, uh, because there were very particular guidelines to help preserve the historical character of the downtown or of the outlying parts of town, and to walk people through that, to work on their add-ons, to work on, you know, siding or whatever improvements they were putting in on their property to help improve and to sustain the historical character of the community. Definitely. It's interesting because um, living in San Francisco, there are so many buildings, I mean, the majority of Victorians as well, that are just designated historical sites, and you, can, you can't really do certain renovations to them. I think you're allowed to gut them and change the inside for a lot of them, but the facade needs to remain the same. So I was wondering if it was something similar. Same idea. And so through all of your various degree programs, so what are the research interests that have been driving you during all of those degrees? I started out in religious history. My BA was actually on the Seven Years' War in the United States, or what would become the United States, as a religious fight against French Canada. I went into teaching at high school level but when I came back for my master's. My focus was on religious history, particularly the First Amendment Non-Establishment Clause. This was 2006-2007 when a lot of reading and society topics were front page news for a considerable period of time. 
So I wanted to take a look to that and see, well, what did the document actually say? And what I found was that there was a lot of context to it that had just been lost. My particular interesting findings was that at the time, nobody really took that religious prohibition and establishment very seriously. It was not like what we see today, even in 2017, in terms of importance on how society would govern or manage itself. It's only a little bit later in the 1790s that that pops up. So I got a master's thesis out of that, and I went into the teaching, where the research interest sort of lay dormant for a while. When I went back to start my PhD, I had changed my focus much more so to take a look at agriculture and agricultural exports. So being from Montana, agriculture is always you know, in the mind somewhere, but I've always loved the early Republic, late colonial, early Republic period. And what I found was that I was able to combine those two. With some of the early, very preliminary research that I found, I was able to marry that with a very ironic sense of humor uh, that I have, and it actually started to mold together into an actual dissertation topic. So what I have is a dissertation that focuses on late colonial, early republic United States and how it does or does not integrate it back into the British Atlantic economy, which sounds pretty you know, straightforward classic history. But getting into the documents, there is a lot of untold stories and a lot of smuggling, a lot of changes in the law just for the purpose of allowing that trade to continue or not to continue, and a lot of fluctuations and variations that you would not expect to see in a political economy time kind of work. So combine that in with an uh, interest in Canada, and it's turning into a dissertation. <laughs> That's great. And so can you tell us a little bit about, so, so since you're currently in the middle of a, of a doctoral program or approaching the end of a doctoral program, can you give us a sense of what is it like to be a, a doctoral student uh, at, at this late stage? I've, we've talked to some other people in this podcast series that are currently entering. They're kind of at the beginning stage. They just finished the applications, they got accepted, and they're about to start. But now that you've been at it for however long you've been at it, I'm, I'm assuming since you're a doctoral student, you've probably been at this for a few years now. What is life like as a doctoral student? You find a, a very strong difference between your start of your doctoral program and after your all but dissertation. The portion prior to being ABD is very similar to what you saw with your master's. Or if you went directly from a bachelor's level to the PhD, it'll be very similar to the most intense senior seminar that you can imagine. Once you're ABD, there is a lot of space. By then, you probably have a pretty good idea of who's going to be on your doctoral committee. You've survived comprehensive examinations, and you are working on your research. So it's very nice in terms of you have the space, you are the expert, you set the research agenda, you set what archives you need to go to. It is a great deal of space. But the cost is that the further and further you get into it, there is a certain element of isolation to it. Now, in my case, I am the only person I know that is researching grain trade across the U.S.-Canada border at this particular time. Now, the good news is, is that you run into other doctoral candidates who are similarly down a rabbit hole to where they are one of the one or two or the only person working on this particular research field. It's sort of a great and scary moment when you go to your advisor with a question and they look at you and say, well, you're the expert. You're the one that's actually researching this. There's nothing in the literature on this. So that is a wonderful moment and scary moment because when you become the expert, you start to put those sorts of things on paper, it's a lot harder to find support within the existing literature. Part of the fun part for me was the travel involved, going to the various archives. Uh, so I've had a chance to uh, go to the archives in Ottawa, down in Philadelphia, Toronto, Halifax, and there's a lot of travel, a lot of archival research, but it does 
give you a certain sense of achievement to be able to come back and start putting together chapters, to start putting together potential journal articles, or even start looking forward to a potential dissertation book, where you are the person who has done this work, you've done all the legwork, you've done all of the research, and this is what you have found. And you hope that it'll make a contribution to understanding the historical field. In my case, I hope that it'll make a contribution to understanding present day economic debate for things like NAFTA or things like that. Uh, but there is a certain set of, it's a little scary sometimes, to, to put it that way. Yes, <laughs> I remember that distinctly because of course one of the responsibilities of the phd student is that you are you do need to be making an original contribution you need to be coming up with something novel and something different from what has been done before and that is a very difficult thing to do and it's often like you said you're kind of making it up as you go and that makes for a very kind of nerve-wracking experience because you'd have no idea if you're doing it right if you're doing it wrong you just hope that once you finally work out the dissertation and start putting it out on paper that you just you just hope that it actually works out at the end right and you'll run into a lot of help in places that you don't think of you know people like archivists uh, the archivist for example in the public archives of nova scotia uh, i had cold emailed him and i got you know a list of sources that he could recommend or, or could think of that would apply to that topic that i was well, i was able to use well, you'll run into people at different institutions, for example, who will have different contacts. Uh, there's a history professor up at Dalhousie University, for example, in Halifax, that you know, my advisor is a friend of his and passed along my email, and I had a great correspondence with him. So there is a level of collegiality once you hit that dissertation writing stage to where you know faculty, professors, people who are well into their careers tend to be very helpful towards you and are very, you know, strongly oriented towards helping your research. One of the harder parts, I think, of the scholarship process is not only being willing to ask, but knowing who to ask. That, that's something that I struggled with when I started. Right. And so how far along are you in your program now? You say you're on your dissertation. Are you, uh, are you still in the research stage? Are you writing? How far along are you? Uh, I'm writing. Have... Uh, most of the research I hope done. Uh, there's a couple of odds and ends that I would love to run into, but uh, we'll see how that works out. Out of a five-chapter dissertation or a substantive chapter, uh, two drafts of chapters are out. One will hopefully be out by Christmas, so I'm really hoping to be done next summer. And just so students who aren't familiar with the process, just, just so they understand, how, how long have you been working on the dissertation up to this point? Uh, this is the start of year six. So it's quite an investment. It's definitely a time commitment. One of the things that had that had always interested, or a reason that I was interested in pursuing a PhD overseas, other than the fact that my topic was very focused on Northern Ireland, was the different the different system and the different expectations for a PhD. I had already completed two master's degrees, and I really wanted to just jump into my research and to. Um, to interviews and primary research, and the idea of sitting through more courses and completing more exams really didn't seem all that appealing to me. Uh, plus, the experts that I wanted to work with were either in Trinity or at the University of Liverpool, so that was kind of where my focus was. So it's also interesting how the experience of grad students in the States can differ from those overseas. Well, in my case, I was pretty well where to go, because being interested in U.S.-Canadian relations and American-Canadian history pretty much you're headed to the University of Maine if you're interested in a PhD because we are pretty close to the program in the States that has that specialty. So shameless plug for the home institution, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Not a problem. So you are working on your dissertation and you recently, uh, you recorded a presentation for us here at Southern New Hampshire University on Constitution Day. Did the, your interest in the Constitution just naturally come out of your dissertation topic, or is this how, how did you arrive at that at the content of that presentation? Uh, most of that is actually based off of the work I did with my masters, as my masters was on uh, religion and public order in the 1790s, focusing on the First Amendment and how the various incarnations of the First Amendment came to be, and how it was used and changed over the 1790s and into the 1800s. 
Uh, so that was scholarship that I had done. And you, know, you, you look at old scholarship and things you've done sort of in passing here and there. And that was one of the elements that popped back up when I was looking at something else for political history. So it was at least somewhat fresh on my mind uh, when the call for constitutional history came out. So it's not really something that I'm focused on now as new research, but it's something that I've also been able to incorporate into some of my teaching. One of the classes I taught, for example, was Amer the American Revolution and Counter-Revolution, which took a look at aging ideas from the 1780s through uh, Jefferson's administration. And that idea on religion and how that intersected with society was a pretty good portion of that curriculum. Yeah, it's always nice to kind of go back and revisit the old research now and then. I, I like to dip my toe back into my master's thesis research. I had a lot of fun with it, and I keep thinking I should go back and do something better with it or publish it or something, but I just haven't gotten around to it yet. But it's always fun to go back and look at the old stuff like that. Well, I, I look at some of my old seminar papers and parts of my old thesis and wonder and start wondering what I was thinking. <laughs> well, yeah, there's that too, that, that, if, that's if you think how wrong you were part before. Of the, <laughs> part of the growth process. <laughs> All right. And so um, let's see. Did you have anything else that you wanted to mention about your career? If we've got students that are thinking about kind of following your footsteps into a Ph.D. program, do you have any suggestions for those students? The suggestions I would have are to be flexible on where it is you want to go and the programs that you want to pursue. If you're considering starting a Ph.D., look very strongly at the faculty, at the various institutions and who you can work with. If you have a good relationship with your advisor, most importantly your advisor, but with the rest of your committee, life is going to be good for you. If you have an advisor you don't get along with, life is going to be very hard. Be aware of the time commitment it's going to take. Uh, the dissertation, when you get there, will start taking over your life in a lot of ways. As I've had days when I can tell you how many ships with grain have gone into Halifax Harbor, but I cannot tell you where my car is. So be aware that it is going to be a, a very intense, in-depth type of uh, relationship between you and your scholarship. Yeah, that's the experience I had, too, is that, yeah, it, it, it does take over your entire life. Usually for a bachelor's degree or a master's degree, oftentimes you can, you know, work outside of it. You can go to school part-time and all of that, but a lot of Ph.D. programs require you to be on campus. You have to basically treat it as it's not even a full-time job it's more like two full-time jobs because usually you're teaching and you're also doing all your research and also taking exams and reading books and writing dissertations and so in the hours per week it turns into more like two full-time jobs even if it doesn't really feel like it at the time but it's a it, it is a very large time commitment and a very large commitment of energy also so to wrap up here, do you have any recommendations for us, uh, particular works of history or artifacts or exhibits or something that has really caught your attention recently? Uh, recently, I did some work down in Castine, Maine. And within the middle of town, they have Old Fort George, which was a British establishment going back to 1779. And they were able to preserve the earthworks of the fort um, almost entirely. Uh, the woods rotted out and things like that, uh, but that sticks in my mind quite a bit as something that is you know, important, significant to my research that's out there on the physical landscape. For scholarship and how my dissertation actually started uh, to loop all the way back around to the beginning was a book and an article written back in 1922 by a guy named Freeman Galton who wrote the one article that exists on the grain trade uh, to Great Britain and to Iberia at this time. And I've been working off of bits and pieces of that since, well, I started my program. That, that was the original start of it. So it has a, a special place in my heart, although most people have probably never heard of it before. Uh, <laughs> Archive-wise, Library and Archives of Canada are wonderful. It's right down the street from Parliament. So in Ottawa, you have Parliament, the Supreme Court, and right next to it's the National Archives. So it is just a wonderful research trip if you happen to be doing something that's related with colonial Canada or even modern-day Canada. James, do you have anything, anything you'd like to recommend for us today? 
Uh, sure. It's not so much of a historical um, or a research focused publication, but uh, I don't know if any of you have watched the show Peaky Blinders yet. It just seems to keep getting better and better, um, and it's loosely based on a gang of ruffians from um, Birmingham that was, they were really active in the late 19th century, but the show itself takes place right after World War One. Killian Murphy is in it, Tom Hardy is in it, and I heard that Adrian Brody just joined the cast, so it's a pretty stellar cast, uh, very gritty, very violent, so if you're you know, if your stomach turns at those things, I would suggest not diving into watching the show. But the writing and everything, it's its brilliant. And it's um, interesting, the more articles that I read, comparing the the myth of the Peaky Blinders in the show to the reality of uh, what it was like to be part of or terrorized by this Birmingham gang in that period is pretty interesting. So if you are interested in a uh, loosely uh, based on history show that is uh, highly suspenseful and interesting just that i mean you can't get much better you know that when it begins with uh, nick cave's uh, red right hand that it's going to be a great show so um tune in very nice well for fictional series uh, it's more my time period than that uh but if you read the bernard cornwell sharp series they also did a mini series off of them starring sean bean uh better known as eddard stark ah uh, uh, yes so it's uh, described as James Bond with a Baker rifle because ha! it starts in the <laughs> 1790s and goes up through uh, Waterloo. And it's it, the history is very good. It's well-researched, but it's this fictional character that Cornwell has put in there. And it will follow through the entire Peninsular War campaign through the perspective of this character. And it's... A very entertaining set of series. The miniseries was done on a pretty tight budget, uh, but when you have Sean Bean in it, you're going to be doing okay. Uh, I believe it's on iTunes, or, well, it's probably, well, everything's on YouTube, so it's probably yeah. there as well. Right. Uh, but it, it gets into some of the history of the time very nicely. Oh, that's fantastic. And then the big question is, does... Sean Bean die because the ongoing joke is that he manages to die in almost every single movie he's ever been in. So <laughs> um, whether he's playing an Irish terrorist or uh, a mythical swordsman in Lord of the Rings, I mean, the man doesn't seem to, or I mean, even um, in Game of Thrones, the man does not seem to live very long, no matter what, what he's in. So well, he makes it through the entire series. Perfect. Holy cow. <laughs> He's moving up in the world. <laughs> that's, a, that's a big moment for Sean Bean. <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to just recommend a, a historian named David Blight. Are either, are either of you familiar with his work? heard no. the name, but I can't remember why. He's a historian of the Civil War and a specifically... He's, he's best known for a book called Race and Reunion. The subtitle is The Civil War in American Memory, which talks about how people remembered the Civil War. And uh, so he talks a lot about you know things like the lost cause and reconciliation between North and South, reconciliation between Blue and Gray, and all of that. It's an amazing book. It won you know it won every award possible back in the early 2000s. But anyway, the reason that he's been on my mind is that he popped up um, a couple days ago on an episode of um, Slate Magazine has a political gab fest podcast, and they brought him on to talk about this idea that John Kelly, who is uh, President Trump's chief of staff, said a few days ago, made kind of a controversial statement, at least it's controversial among historians, that said that the Civil War was brought about by a failure to compromise. Oh, and yeah. so they brought him in to kind of talk about that. And he came in, so it was only a 10 or 15 minute interview that they did with him, but he talked about that idea that the Civil War was the result of a failure to compromise. And he started going into kind of a historiographical discussion. We're talking about how there are historians that have made that argument. Not many people make that argument anymore. And so that's a very old argument. And it's interesting that this guy is kind of embracing this very old historiographical argument when over the last three or four decades, that argument has pretty much fallen out of favor. We don't, there are very few, few historians who think about the Civil War as a failure to compromise anymore. A lot of historians focus on the idea that compromise after compromise after compromise actually led to the Civil War because it, there's only so far you can compromise on something like slavery. And so anyway, the, the interview that they had to get was, was really interesting. Um, it, it kind of starts to go off 
onto tangents about things like Confederate memorials and the kind of deification of Robert E. Lee in the South. And it's a really interesting uh, dis- discussion, and I'll put the link up in the uh, notes for the uh, for this episode here. But it's really interesting because you don't hear very many discussions of things like historiography and changing interpretations of history and all that in kind of a mainstream political pundit type talk show. But David Blight uh, does that pretty well. And if you've never heard David Blight talk, uh, you should just look him up on YouTube or something because he has the most amazing voice. <laughs> it's like gravelly and deep, and it just makes you pay attention no matter what he's saying. And so he, he's one of those people that I could just listen to. He could just read the phone book or something, and I'd be fascinated by it because he just has that type of voice. So anyway, David <laughs> Blight is my recommendation for, for, for this week. Awesome. Right. Thank you, Rob. All right. So uh, thank you, Patrick, for joining us today. Well, thank you, and have a good rest of the day. That's great. Yeah, thank you, Patrick. It was definitely enjoyable. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. If you have any questions or comments on this podcast or suggestions for future episodes, please send me an email at snhuhistory at gmail.com. For James Fennessy and Patrick Calloway, I'm Rob Denning. Thanks for listening.